Hello, in this video we are going to look at Plato's version of the innate knowledge thesis and this involves looking at themes in Plato's dialogue Meno. Meno's paradox, the theory of forms and recollective knowledge. Now as you'll probably know Socrates is famous for having never written anything down um, so the majority of what we know about Socrates comes from his pupil Plato um, but also a little bit um, from the ancient Greek historian Xenophon and uh, the comedian Aristophanes who were perhaps less in awe of uh, Socrates than Plato was. Now Plato's dialogues um, generally go by the names of the main characters involved. Now um, most of them include Socrates right? Um, and generally the names are based on the characters that Socrates is questioning. Uh, in this case, the dialogue Mino, right? Mino is uh, the lead character other than Socrates. So, Plato was in essence a rationalist, right? He believed that knowledge comes or well, came from two sources, reason and the knowledge that we are born with, i.e. innate knowledge. All right? So true knowledge, the fundamental foundations of knowledge, are as such a priori. That is, they are known independent of experience. But Plato's versions of this are quite different from Descartes. Right? If you want to uh, look at Descartes, then there are separate videos um, on him. But they're quite different, and you need to know about both. Um, now, Plato's innate knowledge relies on the doctrine of recollection and on the immortality of the soul and part of this involves understanding Plato's theory of forms. Um, now for the purposes of the A-level um, it's a good place to start is Mino's paradox all right um, and in the dialogue Mino, um, Mino uh, puts the question to Socrates how will you look for something when you don't in the least know what it is? How on earth are you going to set up something you don't know as the object of your search? To put it another way, even if you come right up against it, how will you know that what you have found is the thing that you didn't know? In essence, either one knows the answer already, in which case there is nothing to learn, or one does not, in which case one does not know what to look for. Even if one found what one was looking for, how would we be able to recognize it as such, given we would not know what it is we were looking for? So this is known as Mino's paradox, and it leads Socrates to suggest the idea of recollective knowledge, that we have this sort of um, faint recollection that we're able to grasp fully when we are questioned about it. So... Socrates, as I say, appeals to this idea that the soul is immortal. Now, this isn't fully cashed out as an idea in the dialogue Mino, um, but it is um, in the dialogue Phaedrus, which is well worth reading, even though it's not on the spec. And, and in that, the idea that the, the balanced soul is, um, is existing in the realm of forms, uh, which I will talk about in a little while, but the balanced soul is existing in the realm of forms and provided that reason has control over both spirit and desire, the soul remains in a state of knowledge. If spirit or desire overcome reason, then the, no the soul falls to earth and is incarnated in human form, um, from where it then tries to gradually gain knowledge and climb back up the ladder, so to speak, to the realm of forms. Now that's not something that you actually need to know about but it does provide a little bit of context I think here. So as I say Socrates appeals to a doctrine that the soul is immortal and he says thus the soul since it is immortal and has been born many times and has seen all things both here and in the other world has learned everything that is. So we need not be surprised if it can recall the knowledge of virtue or anything else which as we see it once possessed seeking and learning are in fact nothing but recollection. Now, again, it's worth noting that um, 
a lot of the dialogue me know is given over to discussion of whether virtue can be taught or not hence the reference to virtue in this paragraph but for our purposes we are just going to be looking at the slave boy example so Mino then asks Socrates for a practical demonstration of what he means by recollective knowledge. And Socrates gives this demonstration by getting a slave boy to arrive at the solution of a geometrical problem. What is the length of the side of a square twice the area of a given space? Now Socrates does not actually tell the boy anything about geometry, but rather asks him a series of questions. And the boy then works out the answer by himself. And Socrates claims that he's not actually taught the boy anything, but merely helped him draw out knowledge that he already knows by asking questions. And so in this way, Socrates claims to have demonstrated that the boy has recollected what his soul already knew. And once the boy has mastered this geometrical technique for himself, he can then be said to have turned his true belief, his innate knowledge, into actual knowledge, into knowledge that can be justified. Because remember, um, there's a difference between true belief and knowledge. Right? Knowledge is true belief that can be justified, justified true belief, uh, but just true belief isn't knowledge if you don't have sufficient or appropriate justification. So, as I say, the distinction between, between true belief and knowledge is really important. All right? You can have a belief that's true but unjustified, but to call a belief knowledge, you have to justify it appropriately in order to demonstrate how such a belief is true. So in a practical sense, true belief or right opinion can work as well as knowledge. All right. You might know, for example, how to get back to your house from somewhere else um, and but you might not be able to explain this to anyone else. You just sort of kind of know it by instinct or it's an ability you have. And again, you can tie that up with ability knowledge. But you, if you can't actually justify or explain it to somebody else, then you can't really call it knowledge. It is just true opinion or true belief. OK, it's, it's knowing how rather than knowing that. OK, and so there is perhaps a distinction there um, between um, ability knowledge, which might you could arguably class as just true uh, true belief or right opinion in certain circumstances um, and knowing that which is propositional knowledge okay so one can only call true belief knowledge once one has understood exactly what the reasons are and why that belief is true so as i say you may know how to get back to your house from a particular place but be unable to explain it that wouldn't be a case of knowledge because you wouldn't be able to justify it properly it would just be something that you could do so Socrates describes the efforts of the slave boy as actualizing the potential knowledge within him. He's bringing it out. This, he's bringing out what the slave boy in his innate, sort of in his soul already innately knew. All right. So once the boy can justify his knowledge that the length of the side of a square twice the area of a given square is the length of the diagonal of the original square, he can be said to have knowledge. Once he could then explain that to someone else. So Socrates claims to have justified the assertion that we have innate knowledge given to us by our eternal soul. After all, no one taught Pythagoras his theorem. He justified his belief as knowledge all by himself. All right. So one could say that he found this idea within himself and then developed a way of explaining it and from that turned what turned out to be right opinion into actual knowledge. Similarly, um, the slave boy is only expected to accept the answers that seem reasonable to him in presumably the same way that Pythagoras did the same. Right? It's not a question of just absorbing information being told to him. Socrates tells him nothing. Right? He just asks questions. But once he's understood the answers to Socrates' questions, um, he is then able uh, to teach it to others. And so he's gone from a state of true belief to knowledge. So this progress to improved belief from the slave boy's own resources is compared to recollection. Right? In each case, someone reasons from his present beliefs to an answer which seems beyond him at the start 
until he realized that he had the resources to find it all along. And so you could say that that's what Pythagoras did. Pythagoras just didn't have the luxury of somebody asking him questions. So in this, we've, according to Socrates at least, solved Mino's paradox. Right? Um, and he does this, does this by arguing that the reason we can look for something is that we do have a dim knowledge of everything acquired before we were born because remember the balanced soul was once uh, in the realm of forms so the soul is immortal and our present life is only one episode in its embodied history as it tries to make it back to a complete balance to a complete state of knowledge um, when it inhabits the realm of forms so this is essentially how socrates believes that we have innate knowledge so let's now just look at recollection and the theory of forms in a little bit more detail. All right. So in Mino's um, or the dialogue, Mino, sorry, is really the kind of um, beginning of Plato's theory of forms, which is cashed out in much more detail in his perhaps his most famous work, Republic. All right. And the idea is that every concept we have, such as virtue and geometry, have perfect transcendent forms which exist independent of any examples of those things. Right? They exist in a transcendent realm of complete perfection. All right? Now, when the soul falls away from its existence in that realm of complete perfection, because um, perhaps one aspect of Plato's tripartite soul has gained the upper hand over reason, so it could be desire or spirit or, or both, um, when that happens, the soul becomes imperfect because it's no longer guided by reason, falls out of the realm of forms, right, into um, the physical, imp the imperfect physical realm, all right. If you um, know about Plato's uh, cave, for example, uh, it falls sort of into the bottom of the cave where it takes shadows to be reality. Um, it nonetheless is guided by a dim recollection of the perfect form of virtue as was the slave boy uh, when he was guided by Socrates to solve a geometrical problem. Now, there are quite a few objections to this. Um, firstly, is there any evidence for the existence of a perfect and changeless realm of forms? Right? Where is this so-called place? Um, and if it's outside of space and time, then you know what evidence do we have for it? And if the argument is, well, because it's outside of space and time, there is no evidence, then it does seem a very shaky foundation upon which to base uh, the doctrine of recollective knowledge. OK, so if it can't be known beyond experience, um, then, you know, how can we really sort of base a whole idea or a whole argument upon it? Um, and just as a, as a side note, the same question can also be asked about God. Um, if it's impossible to find out what one does not know already, then how did the soul learn in the first place what it recollects in this life? All right. Um, that's quite a substantial objection. And so while the idea of a perfect circle might make sense, how do we conceive of a perfect tree or a perfect virtue? These things seem much more sort of subjective. So hopefully that's given you some insight into Plato's thoughts about innate knowledge. And that's the end of this video.